Welcome to South Shore Pentecostal Church. I am Pastor J. Craig Olette, and we are so glad that you're here to worship with us today. We are living in a time when many believe that there is no truth, or what was true in the past is not true today. We believe the Bible is the basis of all truth concerning God, creation, man, life, and also shows us the way to be saved from our sins. We hope that the worship and the word you hear today blesses and strengthens you for God's purpose in your life. You can visit us online at www.southshorepentecostal.com. You can also listen to teaching and preaching on the radio at WEZE 590 AM, Monday through Friday at 915 AM. Please stay online as the service will begin shortly.
impossible, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Nothing's God. impossible Thank with God. You, Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Grab your songbooks. Hallelujah, Jesus. Brother Reinhardt's been inspiring me lately. He's been collecting hymnals like he collects regular books lately. And uh, he's got a lot of books. He's probably one of the few people I know that has more books than Brother Olaf. Amen. <laughs> Lots more probably. Hallelujah. But he's been buying uh, buying up hymnals and going through the pages and finding those old songs that he was raised on, that I was raised on. And so I love going back into the song book every once in a while. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. Who is this who for our sorrows offers comfort and relief, bringing sunshine to the dark and shattered light? Saints softly cease repining, lift thy soul above its grief. Let the peace pass understanding, still the strife. It is Jesus, Jesus. so thankful, God, for your great love for us. You are a deliverer and a redeemer, Lord Jesus. We praise you for your faithfulness. Hallelujah. Oops. I need to share something with you that happened today. I'm working on the food drive, which is coming up on May 11th here in Whitman. And um, in the process of doing the advertising part of it, I um, send the blurb of information to all the different news papers and news and so and media sites that can help us out with some free advertising. And I sent one up to the Whitman Hanson Cable, um, and I said, "Can you please run this ad?" Because they have kind of a 
town page where they, in our case, it's Whitman and Hanson, but town events and things that are happening. And um, he sent back an email and he said, hey, do you want to maybe get together and <coughs> we'll put together a video ad and we can do a video and in, 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 in addition to running the regular ad, we'll, we'll run an ad with an interview of, of the food pantry people. And so I talked to the St. Vincent de Paul people and we all agreed to do that. And we met up there today. Well, because I'm so smart, <laughs> I was supposed to be there at 1 o'clock, but I got there at 11. <laughs> and when I did, I was talking to the guy, and um, and I happened to glance over, and they've got kind of this living room thing set up with couches and the TV and all this stuff kind of in the lobby area, welcoming area. And there on the screen is my pastor <laughs> <laughs> preaching and teaching. So they've been taking... Our church service is live, and all of the churches in town as well, but running these, our program Praise God. on the table. So, Amen. and I did not know that they were doing that, but I turned around, and there he was on the big screen. Hallelujah. And I was, oh my gosh, that's my husband. Amen. Praise the Lord. So that was a very cool thing to um, experience today. So we're reaching more than we think. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise God, amen. Whitman and Hanson, all the things, everything that we stream goes up on the town pages there. So it's, praise God, amen. So that's a great, a great thing. So I'm going to ask Brother Stephen to come help us receive an offering here tonight, amen. Amen. Would you pray, brother? Thank you. Lord, I want to thank you for this time in your presence, Lord, that we might seek you and learn of you. As we bring these tithes and these offerings to your storehouse, pray that you bless it and sanctify it, that this gospel message might be spread. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, amen. So you can open your Bibles after uh, Brother Stephen comes by to James one twenty seven, and we're continuing in our lessons on holiness, and tonight it's the principles of holiness, lesson one. There's going to be two or three of principles of holiness, and there's other topics that we're going to cover, as we mentioned in the first lesson, but tonight we're going to delve into some of the principles of holiness. Amen. So let's let's read those scriptures that are up there first. James 1 and 27. And, and there's many scriptures we could put up, but these are a starting point for principles. And James 1 and 27 says, can I get there? It says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and their widows and their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Okay, so keeping ourselves unspotted from the world is what we're focusing on there. James 4 and 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Jude 23, Jude verse 23. It says, And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. And then finally in Revelation 16 and 15, It says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he should walk naked, and they see his shame. So it's talking about keeping us in our walk with God, right? Amen. So one of the first principles in holiness is holiness requires boundaries. Holiness requires boundaries. And if a Christian is going to live holy... They're going to have to set spiritual, emotional, and emotional boundaries and, and maybe some physical boundaries. 
Because there may be some places you can't go or you don't want to go. So we got examples in the Old Testament, the principles. Okay, the tabernacle and temple had boundaries, didn't they? You couldn't just walk in from any side, and anybody couldn't just walk in. The temple and tabernacle had boundaries. There were boundaries and sacrifices in approaching God. I couldn't bring whatever I thought I wanted to. I had spe specified sacrifices that I needed to bring if I was going to give a peace offering or a thanksgiving or a burnt offering or a sin offering. There were specified offerings that I had, had, to, had to bring. And approaching to God, if, if I was unclean, then I needed to purify myself before I could come in to the presence of God. Amen? So there was boundaries and sacrifice approaching God. Boundaries in food, they had different laws of what they could eat and what they couldn't eat. Boundaries in clothing, all right? F familiar scripture to many of us, but Deuteronomy 22 and 5 says that men should not wear women's clothing and women should not wear men's clothing. So Deuteronomy 22 and 5, and these are just, we're just giving ideas. We're just using illustrations. We're not trying to exhaust all the different ideas in any one of those categories. But Deuteronomy 22 and 5, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Now the key there is abomination, because the word abomination means, he says to God, not to you, but to God. So if something's an abomination to God in the past, it's an abomination for him today, okay? Because it's an abomination because it violates God's moral nature. And what's, what's one of the key things here why God is saying this? God wants distinction between men and women. And when that starts to break down, you're breaking down God's natural order in creation. So the first place that starts to break down is in clothing. The next thing it starts to break down is in actions and attitudes, okay? And then, then it starts to break down beyond that. There were boundaries in sexual relations. God was for family and sexual relations, but outside of family, you weren't supposed to be involved in sexual relations. So Leviticus 18 and 22, and again, we're just trying to illustrate that in the Old Testament, for Israel to live holy, they had boundaries in their lives. We call them the Old Testament, the Levit Levitical law, but they're boundaries. Those, that law created boundaries. So Deuteron or Le Leviticus 18, 22, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Neither shall thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before beast to lie down. Therefore, there too it is confusion. Then he adds this statement. Now this is God speaking to Moses. Defile you, not yourself in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. So what God is trying to say, what God is conveying to Israel is, these are customs of the Philistines, of the Ammonites, of the Moabites, of the Edomites, of, of the Syrians. These are customs of the nations around you. You're not going to do that. It's an abomination. Okay, and so a lot of the things that God drew lines there was to prevent them from being corrupted by the nations around them. Again, these are not... Not all, you know, some of these things don't apply to us. Clothing does because the distinction between men and women applies from Genesis to Revelation, okay? If God says something's an abomination in the Old Testament, it's still an abomination today, okay? All these boundaries existed because Israel, they were the people of God, and God is holy, so if we look in Leviticus, the same chapter, Leviticus 11, 44, 45, For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, 
and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. And then again in Leviticus 19 and 2. Leviticus 19 and 2 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now notice, he said all the congregation, didn't he? So in other words, it wasn't just to the priesthood, or just, you know, the kings and the priests and, and people, but everybody was supposed to be there. So all we're saying is holiness requires boundaries. If we're going to live holy, if a person is going to live holy, they have to have boundaries in their life. All right? There's got to be boundaries. And we're going to try to delve into some of the principles behind those some of the boundaries tonight. So we must set boundaries in our lives because we are the people of God. Now, in the scriptures we read in the beginning, we're to keep ourselves unspotted from the world, right? So let's go back and read those scriptures we read again, James 1, 27. And when, when it's talking here, it's not talking about physical dirt on our garments, but it's talking about spiritual stains, isn't it? It's talking about a spiritual stain because our spirit is not right with God. God or something in our life is not right with God. So this is what this is trying to illustrate to us. And in James 1.27, there's, there's a number of things it's saying, but at the end of the verse, it says, verse 27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless, widows in their affliction. So that's good, visit the fatherless, visit the widows, Help them, the orphans, help the poor, help the homeless, help all those, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So that means, in other words, you have to draw a line, okay? If I've got nice clean clothes on and, there, and there's a bunch of dirt out there, I'm going to have to draw a line in my walk if, if I'm going to go through that dirt or go around that dirt. I have to draw a boundary, right? I have to have a separation. And it's the same thing spiritually in our lives. Again, Jude 23. Notice that even in soul winning, even in soul winning, others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Okay, what's he, what's he trying to say there? He's saying... You, we want you to try to reach the people that are backslid or people that are in sin. But when you're reaching the people in sin, you got to be careful you don't get pulled into their mess. So if you don't have proper boundary lines, if you don't know where the edge is, when you're reaching, you fall over. Right? So you got to have boundaries in your life. So it's good. we want to reach but we want to make sure that when we're reaching that I'm not getting pulled in to something God doesn't want me in. All right? Praise God. And again, Revelation 16 and 15. And this, this is Jesus speaking. It may not be red letter, but who's coming as a thief? It's Jesus. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame in other words you are keeping your spiritual walk with god clean that's what that means right so even if you wash your clothes you still got to rewash them right some sometimes more often than others depending on what you're involved in in your daily life so even when we buy new, brand new clothes and clean them and wear them, we're going to take them off, we're going to wash them, put them on again. Same thing for us in our walk with God. That's why we need church. We get stained in the world out there. 
We need to come to God's place of washing. We need to have our garments washed again and again. So sometimes you hear people saying, wash me in the blood. Amen. I don't want red shirt. I want, I want a clean soul. I want my mind washed. I want my spirit washed. I want my thinking washed. Amen. And so we got to keep our we're to keep ourselves from the world. And again, garment in these verses represents our spirit, the inner man, our heart. So notice in Psalm 19, verse 14, David prayer, prays a prayer that I think everybody here is familiar with, has heard it many times, but the contents of the prayer are so important. David closes Psalm 19 saying, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. In other words, just because I'm praying the right prayers, we know, Lord, you're looking beyond just what I'm saying. I need to say the right thing, but I need my heart to align with what I'm saying. Amen? And, that's, and if my inner man is spotted, it affects my alignment. Does that make sense? All right, and this is why, so we have to watch. Okay, again, being a friend of the world makes us an enemy of God. And again, as I've tried to say so many times, being a friend of the world doesn't mean because you enjoy going into the woods and walking, you're a friend of the world. It doesn't mean that. It mean, it's, it's not enjoying because you like life, because you got God and you like life, that doesn't mean you're a friend of the world. Because you like a sunny day doesn't mean you're a friend of the world. But being a friend of the world means you are, you, you can get into the world's ways and it doesn't bother you. You can get in, you can fit in with them as you fit in in church. You can play chameleon. We, we, can, we change the church, we change the world. All right? If you can do that, there's some things in your spirit that allows you to be friendship friendly to the world. Now, we have to go out there, but I don't have to be friends with them. Amen? And so, again, James said, you know, if I'm a friend of the world, I'm an enemy of God. And the reason is, is no man can serve two masters. So we go, we go to Matthew 6, 21. Again, familiar passages. Nothing new, no scriptures that you haven't heard many times. But it says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thy light be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thy eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for he either, either will hate the one, love the other, or else hold to the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And again, mammon there does not mean the devil. It means money. It's money personified. So we can't, we can't serve the things of this world. I cannot make success in this world my goal and expect to make heaven my home. Doesn't mean you can't be successful, but you have to let God bless your efforts. You have to put God first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and that's further down the same chapter we just read, and he will add all these things to you. So if I, if I start to go for the things of this world, money, power, security, first, before God, that's going to become my master. You see a lot of people fall away from church because success and comfort becomes their master. God blesses them and they get, they, they get comfortable with the blessings more than 
with God. Amen. So, and again, when it talks about the single eye, okay, your eye is single, what he's really saying, I believe what he's saying is, if, if your main focus, if your focus is on me and God and the heaven, you'll have light. But if your focus is divided on me and the world, you're going to have darkness. So let's, let's look at James 4 and 4 in the New Living Translation. And it says, it just expands a little bit. Ye adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with this world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, that if your aim is to enjoy this world, you can't be a friend of God. Now, the key is aim. That's your primary goal. You can't be a friend of God. What do you think the scripture means when they say that the Holy Spirit, whom God has placed within us, jealously longs for us to be faithful? So setting boundaries, holiness boundaries, some places that we're definitely supposed to set boundaries, it clearly says this, we're not to love the world system, as we see that in James. Well, let's read another passage that we're familiar with, 1 John 15 and 16. 1 John 15 and 16, love not the world, Neither the things that are in the world, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So I can't love the world and love God at the same time. Why? Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, John is not saying there's nobody nice in the world. John is not saying that there's no that the world is totally devoid of good. He's not saying that. What he's trying to say is, in the world, the main motivating factors in people's lives is what their eyes want, what their flesh wants, and what their pride wants. This is what he's trying to say. So he's trying to help us understand that that is the principles that are running the world, and if you... And I, and me, if we get caught up in the world and we start to get sucked into that system, eventually our flesh is going to run us, our eyes are going to run us, or our pride is going to run us, or all three of them. So this is what it's saying. I can't love the world. I can't identify it, James 4 and 4. Become attached to it. Where your treasure is, there's your heart. Don't let my heart, don't let the world get my heart. The world is constantly reaching for our hearts. Amen. Especially if you watch any media or anything like that, you just, you just have to watch a few advertisements to see that the world is reaching for our heart. Amen. We're not to participate in its sinful pleasures in the world. So, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17. Second Corinthians 6, 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. A yoke is a connection, isn't it? All right? And when animals are yoked, it's very difficult for those animals to be, they can't unyoke themselves unless they pull hard enough to break the yoke. And most of the time, the yoke is designed, unless it's become old or, you know, frail or something, that those animals cannot break that yoke themselves. The master has to take the yoke off. So it's saying, do not make a connection with the world that's going to bind you, that's going to drag you where you don't want to go. This is what the Bible's telling us about here, okay? For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion has light with darkness? Now, if, if, if a lot of politicians understood that, that verse there, they'd be doing their foreign policy a lot different than they are. 
But there's some of them out there that think, oh, I can have communion with anybody. I just got to be nice. You can't have communion with darkness. You can't. That means there's some entities, whether they're people or spirits, you cannot make an agreement with them that they're going to hold to. What concord is Christ with Belial, or what part is he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So God's saying we have to draw boundaries if we're going to be his. There's going to be distinctions between God's people and the world. Now, it does, it's not about necessarily where we live or the kind of house we have or car we drive or job we've got so much as it is our view of what life is about. Okay, when we get saved, our view of what life is about should change. Our goals and priorities should change. What, what's, what's different? Some goals you might throw away. Before I knew God, that was okay, but now it's not. Some things, priorities change. It's, it, it, was, it was a goal, it was a top priority, but now it's moved down the list. It's not number one anymore. It's still there, but this is first. God's things are first. All right, and so well, this is what the verse is saying. I've got to change my priorities, my goals, my purpose. Amen. This is what living for God is about. Okay, now why? The Bible tells us the age, tells us that we live in an evil world. And so in a few places we look, Galatians 1 and 4. Again, it's not, the Bible's not trying to say that nothing in the world is nice. It's not trying to say that there's not nice people or sincere people, it's, but it's trying to help us understand that the environment, the world we live in is not ordered according to God's purpose. So Galatians 1 and 4 says, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Now, world there means age. So he's not saying be delivered from the planet, but he's talking about the time frame we live in. And, and the time we live today, even though it's 2,000 years later, is still part of that age. It's the church age. So we live in an evil age. Are there nice people in the evil age? Yes. Are there good people? Good by our standards, yes. Okay. But at the same time, you have to watch who you connect with because the world itself, the Bible says, it's an evil age. Ephesians 2 and 2, which seems like we've looked at this scripture a number of times recently. And Ephesians 2, 1 and 2, you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. In other words, you're alive because you're born again. That's what quickened is, made alive. I'm alive. Who were dead in trespasses and sins, so it's talking about being born again. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, or the order of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Who's the prince of the power of the air? It's the devil. And the verse is telling us the devil is the one that is ordering this world. He's the one that has got the drive. He's the one that's driving lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Because that fits his agenda. So he's promoting that. That's why the world is in that because the world is being motivated by 
the prince of the power there, but they don't know, just like we didn't know when we weren't saved. I didn't know. I thought I was, I've told them many times, I thought I was somewhere in the middle. Till I got saved, I found out I was not in the middle. I was on the devil's side. By not choosing God's way, I had by default chosen the devil's way. Amen. So it says in Ephesians, 1 John 5 and 19. Verse John 5 and 19 says, And we know that we are of God and that the whole world lieth in wickedness. Apostle John is saying that, right? Verse John 5 and 19. The whole world lies in wickedness. Again, he's not saying nobody's nice. Nobody's good from our standard. But the problem is good from our standard is not good enough for heaven. Good from our standard is not good enough from heaven. That's where many people fail. They look out and see, well, they're nice. They're sincere. Listen, if you read history, you find virtuous good people out in pagan culture before Christ came. If all I needed to be was good and virtuous, Jesus didn't need to come. So you can't do it that way just because people are nice. Again, you don't have an attitude about them. When, when you're not saved, you don't see. You don't understand. All right? So we're in the world, but we're not of the world. John 17, 14 through 16. So John chapter 17, Gospel of John 17, 14. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Okay, and so Jesus is saying, if, if we follow him, the world is not going to like us because we're upsetting their apple cart. They have a different agenda. Now, they're, they're okay with you if what you're doing is helping them. So if you ever notice through history, when things get chaotic enough and lawless enough, they're okay with the revival because it straightens things up for business. That's true. But in general, once everything's stable again, they can do their own business. We are a problem because we're telling them that's not right. We're telling you you can't live that way and get to heaven. Amen. So holiness requires boundaries because we're not of the world. And we're, we belong to the Lord. So as we've already said, three areas of, to avoid, lust of the flesh, our desire, longing of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Dealing with desires of flesh, the eyes, and pride of life requires monitoring our thought life. To live for God, you have to start to become aware of your own thought life. Why am I thinking that? Where'd that come from? Wow. Hope God didn't see that in my mind. Of course he did. But he's a merciful God. So we have to learn to monitor our thoughts. Why do I want to go over here rather than there? Why don't I want to do this? But God's asking me to do it. We have to learn to monitor our, our thoughts. Proverbs 23 and 7. Proverbs 23 and 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. In other words, 
what we are thinking about really reveals who we really are. Our thought life reveals the real person. Not how loud we shout or even how many people we bring to church and we need to do all those things. Those are good. But what I, my thought life is what God sees. That's why it says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, my thought life, And if you've ever struggled with your thought life and you're trying to get under control, you realize, you start to think about where did that come from? You recognize, oh, I was watching this or I read this or I was doing this. Hmm. Let's get that out of there if I don't need to do that. You got to draw boundaries. You got to draw boundaries. Amen? What do we think about? Where does my, 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 my thought life go when I, my mind is idle? Those are clues. Those are clues to who, who you are and what's going on inside of you, where your mind goes. If it's constantly going to a place it shouldn't go, you need to ask yourself, why? What's, is there something in me that's not given to God. Amen? Amen? What, what do I think about? Do, why do I think about what I'm thinking? Again, that's the question. I'm thinking about something. Why, why, why is that there? I, I've had to leave stores and malls because of the music they were playing. Because that was going to, I knew it was going to stick in my head. And when I was already home from the mall, that song was going to go around with those words. So I'm out of there. Now maybe that's not an issue for you, but that's a, just an example that you have to look at. You know, where did that come from? That song. So monitoring our affections. Again, what, what, what is motivating me? Is God motivating me or my desires motivating me? What do I put first? If church interferes with what I want to do, does church win? Where's my affection? Right? Now, of course, and we understand that there are times because of schedules and families and all kinds of things that come up and you don't make it. You know, you, you might not make it to church because you've got to take care of something in your job. We understand that. But do you make priorities? Do you make church a priority? Do you make God a priority in your life? Do you make seeking God a priority in your life? And when there's a conflict, where's your heart? Now, we, we have to face the, the, the reality that, yes, living for God is full of joy and peace, but there's also sacrifice in it, which means sometimes I'm not going to feel like doing what I need to do to live for God. That's right. I'm not always going to feel like praying. Even if I got a good prayer life and I'm able to get into the presence of God, 99% of the time, there's going to be times where I do not feel like praying. There's going to be times where I don't feel like going to church. There's going to be times where I don't feel like worshiping. But it's just kind of like with Hezekiah. God delivers Jerusalem, but then when... When the Babylonians come, God steps back to see, what are you going to do, Hezekiah? I showed them all my, my treasure. Well, you're going to get judged. All the treasure you saw, it's all going away. The Bible says God stepped back. God left him there to try to see how he's going to handle the situation. God does the same thing for us. Let's give the Lord a praise. Lord God, we thank you, Lord.
We love you, Lord God. We praise you. We thank you, Lord. Help us, Lord. Lord, we're flesh. We're weak, Lord God. We need your strength. We need your understanding, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. And you know, breaking things off in your life when you come to God that are not a guy is just like breaking up with a girlfriend or boyfriend you know is no good. How many people stay, stay in a relationship they know that's no good? It's not easy to just break it. And the same kind of thing happens when you're living for God. Sometimes it's hard to break some things out of your life. But you have to do them to live for God. Okay, setting bound, holy boundaries requires honesty. In order to set boundaries, we must be honest with ourselves. Right? If I'm not honest, I'm, I'm either not going to set the boundary or I won't set it in the right place. You got, well, if you have people that their habit has been lying, a liar, if, if liars are lying to other people, they're also lying to themselves. And that has to be done away with them for them to set up proper boundaries. Because otherwise they'll say, well, no, no, they, you know, everybody else is doing that, but I, I, I can do this here. When maybe you can't. You might even need it further than other people. So you have to be honest with yourself. So notice 1 Corinthians 15, 33. And th this is talking about the importance of setting boundaries. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. So if I'm hanging around with people that got evil communications, even though I love God, believe in God, it's going to eventually corrupt me if I've got a choice. Now, if it's something I've got to, I've got to be there because my job requires it or there's some reason why, God will help us in that. But if I've got a choice, evil communications will corrupt good manners. The Bible says so. The Bible's saying it. I'm not saying it. So that means I can't watch anything I want on TV. I can't go to any movie that I want. I can't read any book or any article in the newspaper that I want. I can't listen to any music that I want to because evil communications, not might, will corrupt good manners. And then 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. Again, this, this, this we're talking about in, in light of being honest with ourselves. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove or test your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobate. Oftentimes, in our prayer life, we've got to examine ourselves. Am I doing what God wants me to do? Am I doing it with the right attitude? Maybe I'm doing the right things, but not the right attitude. Am I doing it for the right reason? Does this make sense? Amen. And so we have to set boundaries, and we have to be honest with ourselves. And setting boundaries, again, as I've already said, may require you to break habits. Because I know for me, where my thinking went, there wasn't really any boundaries on it before I was saved. Didn't act it all out, but there really wasn't any boundaries. Well, it was pretty hard to rope that all in because it went wherever it went. And having it go wherever it went created a bunch of habits. So when you get near something that was 
similar, the habit, you went right down the train of thought that led you right back to the place that you were in the world, in your thinking. And with our thinking often comes our feelings. So living for God, drawing boundaries in your life, often requires us to break some habits. And that takes in intentional effort. It takes intentional effort to do that. So a couple other areas is temperance. Temperance means self-control. Okay, part of being holy or living holy, I've got to learn to have self-control in my life. Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27 talks about, he says, I need control. Paul, just because Paul has seen the Lord and he's an apostle, he's a soul winner, he's called to be an apostle, he's got gifts and all kinds of things happening, Paul does not think I can just do anything that I want. So he's, notice that he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, Know ye not that they which run a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway or a reprobate. What Paul's saying is, whatever I preach, I apply it to myself. I'm living the same life. I don't think just because God has used me to prophesy, to give revelations, to heal, to deliver, to see people saved. Paul says, that doesn't mean that I've arrived. I've still got to watch my own self. i still got to make sure that I'm in the faith. i still got to make sure that my body is under control. Amen. So temperance means self-control and moderation and all. We're to deny self-will, okay? doesn't mean you don't have a will about anything, but when my will collides with God, I need to yield. If God says to do this, but I want to do this, I need to do this. And oftentimes, God will test us to see if he can take us further into further depths. So he'll test us to see, are you going to listen to me? Or are you going to do your own way? Well, I don't understand why. That's not the point. Did God ask you to? Does God want you to? Temperance is a part of the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Because it's fruit, we grow in it, right? may not be there instantaneously, but it should develop in us over time, shouldn't it? Amen? Okay, and, and again, when you talk about the fruit of the Spirit, it doesn't say the fruits, plural of the Spirit. It says the fruit. So the fruit is a composite fruit with nine aspects, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, on down to temperance. So it's all of that makes up the fruit. When that's not all there, the fruit's not completely ripe or mature. Amen? Again, we're supposed to add temperance to our life. 2 Peter 1, 5 and 6, self-control. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5, Besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience. So it's telling us I need to add self-control. 
I need to put boundaries on. That's what it's saying, right? Self-control is boundaries. God will give you that. You might say, well, I got a temper. But the Bible says God's not giving us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and sound mind. That sound mind really means self-control. So God, God will give us what we need, but I've got to yield to God. So temperance, self-control in our emotions is a boundary, right? Another one is abstain from the appearance of evil. You don't hear a lot about that today, but 1 Thessalonians 5 and 22 says, abstain from all appearance of evil. So in other words, refuse to participate in anything that would associate us with evil. Do you know that in a lot of these protests going on, there's kids going along that don't even know why they're protesting? It's a fad. It's cool. They're caught up with the crowd. And they're involved in evil, a lot of them. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Refuse to participate in anything that would associate us with evil. Do things without murmurings and disputings. Be harmless and blameless without rebuke. Now, it doesn't mean just harmless and blameless to the church, but it means in your life, right? So the, if I'm going to be blameless in my life, then i got to live in a way that does not incriminate me. Amen? Let's read Philippians 2, 14 and 15, just so we read the scriptures there. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation or people, among whom you shine as lights in the world. In other words, we need to live our lives in a way that doesn't dim the witness God of God in our life. Avoid doubtful activity, 2 Timothy 2.19. We're probably going to have to stop before we get, we won't get through all this tonight. So. Second Timothy 2.19. He says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. In other words, if I'm going to talk about Jesus, and I'm going to say I'm a Christian, I need to get sin out of my life. Right? Are we okay? Does that make sense? All right. Setting boundaries. The Bible says, flee from evil. Abstain from all appearance from evil. There's some things you got to run from. Some things you don't want to hang around for. There's some things God gives us power to fight. You stand and fight. You're holding your ground. But there's some things you need to run from. Don't try to fight them. Get out of there. Like Joseph. Don't try to reason with Potiphar's wife. I'm getting out. She's been talking, talking, talking. I've been saying, no, now today she's grabbed me. I'm out of here. I'm not going to try and reason. I'm gone. So flee fornication. 1 Corinthians 6, 18, Amplified Bible says, flee from impurity in thought, word, and deed. Don't allow yourself to get into situations that could lead to sexual immorality. Christian... People are doing this all the time. I'm smart enough. Oh, I know myself. You don't know yourself. There's a reason why the Bible says flee it. Because it's a powerful snare, a powerful attraction, and can be a snare. Listen, even the world knows it. That's why they 
put it in the advertisements. That's why spy agencies have honey pots. What are those? They're women designed to seduce the other agents. That's a regular part of their repertoire. They're called, they're called honey pots. And they're women that will go and get the agents involved sexually, and now they're compromised. And the woman's either going to expose their infidelity, their relationship, or they're going to give secrets away. And again, our world thinks if you're drawing a line, you'd expect some flack. Mike Pence said when he was vice president, I'm not getting in the car with any other single woman unless my wife's there. And they made a lot of fun out of him. But he said the right thing. He had the, the strength and the courage to say the right thing. Hallelujah. Flee idolatry. And even though those are idols made by men's hands, there are spirits that go with those idols. Don't bring them in your house. Don't think, well, I can bring them in and set that right there. Just because I don't believe it. I can bring in a Buddha. It's just a nice thing. Do not do that. Flee from idolatry. Do not bring in things that have re religious symbols from other countries into your house. You'll bring things into your house that will create a problem. Flee covetousness and the love of money. That's what he, Paul told Timothy. Sometimes you got to run from materialism. The love of money. Money is not evil, but when my heart gets on it, it becomes evil. Having things is not evil, but if those things keep me from living for God, they become evil. Now my heart is on that. And then he says, flee from youthful lusts. There are a lot of things that when we're young that come upon us that are even stronger than maybe in later age. But some things we've got to run from. You've got to set boundaries. What does that mean? It means I can't hang out with everybody. I have to be careful where I go. Not just because I'm a pastor. Even when I wasn't a pastor, still be careful where I go, who I hang out with. We're going to stop there tonight because I don't want to take it too long. It's Wednesday night, and I understand that. So let's understand that if you're going to live holy, you're going to have to set some boundaries in your life. And we're not under the law, so we don't have to, you know, have the ceremonial boundaries that Israel had or, you know, the, the food boundaries. But we do need to look at the principles that God used for holiness and look at applying those in our own lives. Amen? So let, let's stand tonight. Lord God, we're seeing in your word, Lord, that we need boundaries, but we also understand that we need understanding. Give us wisdom. Give us strength. Give us discernment, Lord God. Help us to understand the principles behind the boundaries for holiness. Help us understand that we need to set them. Help, help us understand where they need to be. Help us understand that they're important. They're not just nice, but we need boundaries in our lives if we're going to live for you. We ask you, Lord, to strengthen us. If we've got habits that we need to break, give us strength to break them, Lord God. If our thinking is, is out of control, help us to realize. Give us strength, Lord, to reign in our thinking, Lord God. Give us things to replace in our thinking and our mind with words, your words, the scripture and psalms and hymns, Lord God, that we can remove out of our mind thinking things that are not in agreement with you, Lord God, and that we can be in agreement with you in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. Amen. Praise, praise the Lord. Shake hands with somebody. Say, I got to set some boundaries.